My sermon this morning is primarily revolves around Jesus heals a demon possessed boy. But I will be telling you it's probably one of the saddest stories in the Bible. And I'll let you know why in a minute. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 17, 14 to 20. And while you're looking there, Marcia told me some information on the car when I was in the car this morning. And I'm going to pass it on to you. The Hebraic numeric value of the three nouns in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, are God, heaven, and faith. They all add up to God's perfect number, seven, seven, seven. So God's triple perfect number is 777 in Hebrew, numeric value, says God, heaven, and earth. I thought that was pretty amazing, that. I thought I'd share that with you this morning. Anyhow, back to Matthew 17, 14 to 20. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples. But listen, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse, which means corrupt and improper, generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me, he said, Jesus rebuked. And he rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed right at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Well, why couldn't we drive it out? Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Listen, nothing will be impossible for you. This is the disciples that Jesus taught. This is the disciples who followed Jesus. This is the disciples who loved him and knew everything. And yet, Jesus had to rebuke them with the words, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? He said, Bring the boy to me. Now, I have a new friend in England called Keith Oliver. He's president of Full Gospel in Chippenham. And just as a call out for him, they meet every fourth Friday in the town hall. The reason I mention Keith is he gave a, a nice explanation of what I just said. I'm going to read it because it's very good. He says, Jesus arrives on the scene to find his disciples arguing with some teachers of the law, probably over some dry doctrinal points that listen, that are unimportant and unedifying. Then a man, he called it a bloke. If you're English, you know I'm all, who know the one I'm all about. Then a bloke came along, and he came to Jesus and said, Master, my lad is demonized. And he keeps throwing fits and ended up hurting himself during one of his wobblies, which means tantrums. I asked your disciples for help, but they couldn't. So can you help me, Jesus, please? He seems that they were too busy arguing over the finer points of doctrine. 
Jesus commanded the demon to go instantly, and the lad was sorted out. Jesus tells his disciples that this type of healing only comes out of prayer and fasting. Or in other words, they had become complacent, which means smug and self-pleased. Then the disciples tell Jesus about a fellow who they watched casting out demons in his name. Like they should have been doing, but they couldn't do it, the followers of Jesus. Either because they couldn't really be bothered, or because they were too busy, arguing, so that they tried to stop him. Jesus tells them not to stop, because those who are not against him has to be for him. There's no middle fence to sit on. You're either for Christ or against Christ. No sitting on the fence. No middle ground. So therefore, Jesus said, if they're not against me, then they must be for me. At that point, he says, pardon? Stop. Rewind what you just said. They have no real power. The disciples, they can't cast out demons. Or heal the sick. Or speak in tongues. Why? Because they were complacent. Not fasting or praying, as Jesus said. What were they thinking? Probably, well, after all, we don't need to because why? We're with Jesus. We're saved. Here's the best part. We know the right doctrine. And that's what they were arguing about. Doctrinal things. Religiosity. Religious things. More interested about the law. Remember the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, Sadducees and Pharisees? Is that what they were all about? And they missed Jesus, the Messiah? Because all they wanted was the law. Too busy arguing. Too busy stopping the real Christians from getting on with the job of fighting demons, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, and touching lives with what? The power of Jesus. Have we changed much in 2,000 years? Since that scripture of Matthew 17, 14, 20. Let me tell you. There are two forces that affect us. Physical and spiritual. One on the outside. One on the inside. One our soul controls. And the other our spirit is in charge. We fight two battles. Our emotions and our wants and the spiritual forces around us. God operates in the all spiritual realm. Are we listening to ourselves or letting God work through us in the spiritual realm? Were the disciples trying to cast out demons in the physical? Or the spiritual? Are demons physical? Or spiritual? They are spiritual. Then why are you trying to cast them out in the physical? Was it all about them, the disciples, letting God do work through them? No. Jesus won't work through them. God won't work through them. They were too busy arguing. So where was their faith? I'm going to move now to Acts 19, 13, 17, if you want to look it up. Be in here for a little while. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus 
over those who are demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, Jewish chief priests, they were doing this. Listen. One day the evil spirit answered them. It said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit, guess what happened? He knew it wasn't Jesus with them. He knew it wasn't Paul who knew how to use it. He jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. The evil spirit beat up the seven sons of Sceva, both spiritually and physically. They never fought in the spiritual because their faith was weak and the spirit overpowered them spiritually. And guess what the spirit done? He gave them a bloody nose in the physical. The spirit didn't do it. Physically, the spirit controlled the physical and the man that the spirits were in physically beat up the seven sons of Sceva because they didn't know what they were doing. They were using power that they never had any control and never knew what that power was. Or better still, where it came from. It came from Jesus and they didn't know Jesus so they never had the power. They were religious, not strong in the spirit. They thought they had the power, whereas the power to defeat was asleep. In a spiritual faith that they never invoked. A bit like trying to knock a building down with a heavy hammer. What will you do? Put a few dents in it. Then along comes a crane with a ball on the end of it. Smashes the building down in one swing. Are you making dents? and get in nowhere? Are you banging your head against a wall and just hurting your forehead? Are you really making a difference where you are? As Jim Dinger said on Friday, pastor of Newcastle Self Assemblies of God, were you walking and stepping out in the authority of God? Was God with you? Was you working not for God, but was God working through you? Were you using the big iron ball on the end of the crane to smash your way through and break down those walls between you and God? A bit like, however, disciples encountered, guess what, another similar situation in Mark 9, 38, 40. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name again. And guess what they said? They told him to stop. The man was driving out demons, which they couldn't do before, and this man's driving demons out, and they told him to stop. Because he's not one of us. He's not one of the gang. As we talk politically at the moment, not one of the squad. Do not stop him, Jesus said. For one, no one knows who does a miracle in my name, can in a moment say anything bad about me, because listen, for whoever is not against us is for us. This would be the third time the disciples have made a mistake, not invoking the Spirit. When someone does invoke it, they've got to quest that or quash it down as fast as they can. Why? Because they are not one of us. I hope none of you here this morning says, you're not one of us, so you're not worthy. You were never worthy for Christ in the beginning. 
but it accepted you for who you are, what you are. And the Father said he would remember your sins no more. Remember that? Was this person any different to the seven sons of Sceva? Notice that in Mark, Jesus said, don't forbid them from casting out demons. Whereas in Acts 19, it is the demons themselves who are willing to be cast, unwilling to be cast out by someone using the name of Jesus. In Mark, it would be humans resisting. And in Acts, it would be the demons. In the Acts passage, we have someone attempting to cast out demons who is clearly unworthy to do so. When the demons say to the sons of Sceva, I know Jesus, they are admitting that Jesus has power over them. When they say, I know Paul, it is because they have heard that Paul is the one who correctly uses the power of Christ. The sons of Sceva knew the words, but not the Christ. The demons were aware of this, and they pounced on them. When fighting demons, Paul says in Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, John, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Strong in the Lord and mighty is his power. They wear the armor of defense, not offense. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, I will say that again. For our struggle or our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil. Where to? In the heavenly realms. What happens in heaven happens on earth. Where was Gabriel with his message to Daniel? Fighting the prince of Persia, where to? In the air. Who was the prince of Persia in control of? Nebuchadnezzar. Who had to give Gabriel a hand up in the heavenly realm so Gabriel could deliver his message to Daniel? Who? That's heavy. Heavy, I know that's heavy, John. Michael, the warrior, the archangel, had to come down and fight the prince of Persia in order that Gabriel could deliver his message. Which was what, 90 days late, I think, or 60 days late? Just because you think God has not heard your prayers doesn't mean to say that he's not going to act on them. God hears all your prayers. The only difference is, it gets done in his time, not your time. If your time is right now, today, then probably that's not going to be the answer. God will do it in his time, his way, his place, for the right reasons and not your reasons. The only offensive weapon we have is the word of God. Because there are real forces around that are not under your control. You have to realize that. Jesus is in control, and demons cringe at his name. You are not in control. He is. Second Chronicles 16.9 for the eyes of the Lord range through the earth to strengthen those whose heart are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. In other words, if you're going to fight demons, 
know how demons are actually defeated. Don't be going into the ring, Pearl, when you know, when you don't know who you're fighting. It's okay, she had a rotocuff operation and she's in a sling at the moment. Looks as though she just give a left hook. <laughs> By the living word of God called the scriptures is how you defeat demons. Our faith in Jesus can move mountains, but we have to believe that Jesus can do what we pray for. Even small faith when exercised can accomplish great things. Small faith is better than no faith at all. Faith has a potential to grow larger and larger. Just like the minute mustard seed, remember, that could move a mountain if you had that much faith, a itsy bitsy. Remember what, or think about what it would be like if you had a large amount of faith. Bigger than a mustard seed. Some say that could be frightening. Jesus makes it clear that if we live in a spirit of faith, nothing is impossible for us to live above the limitations of this life. Jesus cured diseases. He drove out demons. Jesus had the power over nature. He turned water into wine. And then he walked on that water. Jesus overcame death through the power of the resurrection. Study the word. Pray more frequently. Worship with your heart. I'm going to read you some scriptures now of what kind of faith does it take to move mountains. Matthew 17:20 states that only an amount of the size of the grain of a mustard seed is enough. Matthew 9, 2. And behold, they brought to him a man, sick of palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their face, said unto the sick of the man of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, listen, thy sins be forgiven thee. Mark 5, 34. He said unto her daughter, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Matthew 9.22 But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. That was the woman with the issue of blood who touched the hem of Jesus struggled to get there knowing that all she had to do was just touch part of his clothing and she would be healed from the issue of blood that she's had for many 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 years and she was healed instantly Luke 4 8 48 he said unto her daughter be of good comfort thy faith I've made thee whole go in peace. Not many more. Mark 7, 25, 30, the Syrophoenician woman's daughter had a devil in her and was healed by her faith. She was told three times by Jesus, I haven't come for the likes of you. I haven't come to heal the likes of you. I've come for my people. Then in the end, because her faith was so great, he said, daughter, go. Your daughter is healed because of your faith. Matthew 8, 5, 14, the centurion whose servant was sick and was healed because he had the faith to search out Christ and said, there's no need for you to come to my... Is it daughter? Yeah, servant. Because I know that you just got to think it or speak it. And it will be done. And he said, because of your faith, it is done. Go home. Luke 7, 11 to 19. The ten lepers were healed. One of them came back. Said, thank you, Lord. 
Mark 2, 3, 5. The man let down through the roof was healed. It wasn't his faith. It was a man who let him down through the roof. Faith that got him healed. And I'll tell you now, from that moment on, that man was, had more than enough faith as he was healed. And the last one, Luke 8, 40 to 48. We've already touched on the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment in the street was healed. The lame, the blind, and the insane were all healed. I'm telling you now, all these nameless people were not great followers of Jesus. Not all were regular worship attendees like yourself. Nor upright or respectable citizens. But they all exercised that mustard seed speck of faith. And they were healed. Faith of a mustard seed. Why don't more have that kind of faith? Matthew 17, 14, 20 says the main reason is the very same reason the disciples could not heal the man's son in the beginning of the sermon. As he said, you perverse generation. It was because of their unbelief. We don't believe that God really hears our prayers or answers. We don't believe in what we ask God to do for us is enough. Why do we always put our hand at the back when we pray for something to happen and we drag it away because we've handed it to God but don't believe he can do it so we try and do it ourselves. If you hand it to God and put it in his hands, you walk away. You walk away with the knowledge of knowing it's his problem. He's going to sort it out. He's going to heal it. If you take it back, that's basically saying, I don't trust you, Lord. I don't trust you. If you're going to trust and obey, leave it at his feet. And you have to do it. It's hard, I know. We don't need God's help except in emergencies. You don't have love for a fellow man, only for a certain chosen close friends. Remember, love thy neighbor? Love thy neighbor means everybody you come into contact, not the person living next door or, or your family. Everyone, and I mean the homeless, the sick, the perverse. You love everyone. We don't have a prayer life at all. We don't read our Bibles. We simply don't care for spiritual things except for, guess what, when we are in trouble. Then it's, oh God, help me. Better off to have God's help in the beginning. You might not have had the problem in the beginning. Prayer goes hand in hand with faith. If you have plenty of prayer life, guess what? You end up with plenty of faith. How can we say I have faith in God and never call on him except in emergencies and difficult times? How can we expect our prayers to be answered when we are not even sure or believe they will be heard? Jesus could quote verses of scripture on and on and on. Does this give you a clue about power, signs and miracles? When Jesus was tempted by the devil on the mountain, how did he defeat Satan when he was tempting him? It was with the power and the knowledge of the scriptures. That is how demons are defeated. That is how you defeat Satan. De Satan was defeated on a cross by Jesus. You just have to believe it. Just quote those scriptures at him and see what happens. Get behind me, Satan. The Bible tells us that if we only seek, we will find it, and this includes faith. The most important thing of all is belief. We must believe. We must believe that Christ is who the Bible says he is. That God will answer our prayers. That God cares for us. 
that we can do all things in Christ. That through God we can overcome the world. Plenty of places in the Bible, scriptures will tell you this. But you should already know because you read the Bible. But not know if you don't read the Bible. It brings peace of mind and soul with God. We are no longer afraid to speak for Christ. No longer afraid to say amen in church. Hallelujah. Our lives will no longer be barren, fruitless. And here's the best one, have no meaning. What meaning have you got in your life? Where are your goals at the moment? Where do you want to be in five to ten years' time? And if you're 70 years old, do you think that's it? Do you think that's it? Sit down and just wait for the funeral director to knock on the door? I don't think so. Still have a life. Still have legs. Still have a voice. Still have eyes. Still have a mind. Why aren't you speaking more of Christ? That's all he asks you to do. We will grow in grace, faith, and love and knowledge. There are no limitations to an individual or to a church family once this tiny speck of faith is gained and applied in Jesus' name. Our attendance will grow and grow. Believe that God in his will can do all things. Before I end with a, something that Charles Spurgeon said nearly 200 years ago, I'm going to finish with this. Listen very, very carefully. This is very important. If you believe that you can lose salvation, then I have no doubt that you can. Because you are trusting in the wrong thing for it. On the other hand, if you believe that you cannot lose salvation, then you never will. Why? Because you are trusting in the right person for it. Think about what I just said. I'm going to finish with Charles Spurgeon. He lived in the late 1800s. Listen carefully. Unbelief is not an inability to understand, but a willingness to trust. It is the will, not the intelligence, that is involved. Unbelief isn't weakness of faith. It sets itself in opposition to faith. Hearken, O oh unbeliever, you have said. I cannot believe. But it would be more honest if you were to have said, I will not believe. The mischief lies there. Your unbelief is your fault, not your misfortune. This is a disease, but it's also a crime. It's a terrible source of misery to you, but it is justly so, for it is an atrocious offense against the God of truth. Did I not hear someone say, ah, sir, I have been trying to believe for years. Terrible words. They make the case still even worse. Imagine that after I've made a statement, a man should declare that he did not believe me. In fact, he could not believe me, though he would like to do so. I'd like to believe you, but I can't. I should feel grieved, and certainly so, but it would make matters worse if I added, in fact, I have been for years trying to believe you, but I just can't do it. Imagine someone saying to you, I wish I could believe you. For 40 years, I wish I could believe you, but I can't. How is that making you feel? 
going to give you a little hint now. 40 years the Jews went round the desert. What does he mean by that? Is this Charles Spurgeon still? What can he mean but I am so incorrigibly false and such a confirmed liar that though he would like to give me some credit, he really can't do it. You feeling bad now? Can you picture anybody like that? I can't. I don't think I know anybody who is that against me so much. With all the effort he can make in my favor, he finds it quite beyond his power to believe me. And I will finish with the last sentence. Now a man who says I've been trying to believe in God, in reality he says just that will regard to the Most High. A man that says I've been trying to believe in God for four year, 40 years, but I can't. Do you know how that makes God feel? Calling him a liar. Calling him untrustworthy. Calling him someone who doesn't care. Calling him a liar for writing all those words in the scriptures that he didn't mean. Said he's a liar because he sent his son down. to cleanse your sins, but more importantly, and the final one, I just don't believe there is a life after death. Scripture says we all live for eternity. It's just a matter where we live for eternity. They either live in a five-star hotel mansion in heaven with God, or we're down in the dumps downstairs, not happy where we're to for eternity, gnashing of teeth, crying, moaning. And you're saying that Christ is a liar, God the Father is a liar, Holy Spirit is a liar. I'm going to say to you this morning, What else is there? Is this is all life is about? Three score and ten and then I die? Finished? And I'm willing for three score and ten to believe that life after death just don't exist, that there's no creator? What have I got to lose? What have I got to lose just to say, I believe you, Lord. I believe you sent your son to die on the cross. I believe you washed my sins away. I believe that there is a life after death and it's going to be living with you for eternity. Is it hard, that hard to say I believe? Bow your heads. Thank you, Lord, for good morning. Thank you for... What can I say? Giving me a good subject matter for the sermon. It's relevant in your time. It's relevant today in this perverse generation, the same as the perverse generation coming out of Egypt and during the times that you walked this earth. Lord, I thank you for choosing me I didn't choose you, you chose me, and I thank you for that, Lord, and I will be eternally grateful for that, because I will be living with you eternally and worshiping you and thanking you for what you've done in my life, and I say all this in Jesus' name, amen.